Good morning and happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath, everybody. Uh, happy Sabbath, everyone. So today we are starting a brand new quarter on Hebrews. And today's lesson is, is called the letter to the Hebrews and to us. And we're going to see how this all plays out today in our first quarterly lesson. But before we do anything, we need the most important participant, and that's the Holy Spirit. David? Yep. And by the way, it's David and... And oh, Barbara. Boy, Barbara, I forgot you for a moment. <laughs> I know, right. it's one of those things. It's only when I need to say your name to Satan go, nuh-uh. <laughs> so let us invite the most important member. David, could you pray? Thank you. Let's bow our heads for prayer. Our Lord Jesus Christ, Father God and Holy Spirit, we come before you on this Sabbath day worshiping your name because you loved us so much. For you have given your son for us, and because of that, we are saved. Lord, we come to you with that promise for your love, for your blessing, for your mercy. Lord, help us today so that the Sabbath school lesson that you have provided us, Lord, that we can earn and uh, understand and digest the spiritual food that you have placed before us. Lord, it is not us speaking. Let it be your Holy Spirit speaking for all of us, Lord. And let our words, let the Spirit Talk to each and every one who will be watching and joining us on this uh, uh, session, Lord. We again thank you, Lord. It's the first lesson of the quarter. Lord, we know there are challenges, but we know you said, with man, this is impossible, but with God, everything is possible. In that promise, in that note, Lord, we thank you and praise you. In your name, I ask all these mercies and blessings. I amen. 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 Thank you, David. Thank you. <coughs> okay, so today we're looking at Hebrews, the letter to the Hebrews and to us. And we're going to look at the memory verse, Hebrews 10, 36. For you have need of endurance, so that when you have done the will of God, you may receive what was promised. I love how the memory verse summarizes the lesson for today. What do we need endurance for? What are we enduring? And we're going to see how persecution will be a big part of that. We're going to look at um, what we're doing the will of God is, and we're going to see what reward that is. We are looking heaven-bound. So let's look at the book of Hebrews. Who wrote it? Now, we're told Paul, right? But how do we know that? So when we look at this, in the earliest Greek manuscripts from about 200 AD, we find the book of Hebrews tucked in right after Romans, grouped with the epistles written by Paul, and Hebrews ends in the normal Paul epistle as well. It doesn't start in the normal way, but it ends with uh, Hebrews 13, 23 through 25. Take notice that our brother Timothy has been released, with whom, if he comes soon, I will see you. Greet all of the leaders and all the saints. Those from Italy greet you. Grace be with you all. So we see Timothy's incarcerated somewhere, <laughs> it appears, and that's kind of the, the theme that we're going to be encountering today. But that is Paul's general ending to a letter or epistle they would write. So we see in the beginning, though, he's doing it quite a bit differently um, from his normal writings. And Paul's other epistles are written to a specific person or a group or a church in a certain city. But with Hebrews, it's more of a sermon. Paul is preaching. And we see hints of this in Scripture. We look at Hebrews 13, 22. Towards the end it says, But I urge you, brethren, bear with this word of exhortation, for I have written to you briefly. Well, we see that word exhortation in other Scripture as well. For instance, in Acts 13, 15, which reads, After the reading of the law and the prophets, the synagogue officials sent to them, saying, Brethren, if you have any word of exhortation for the people, say it. Paul stood up and motioning with his hand said, Men of Israel, and you who fear God, listen. So we see after verse 16 there that Paul continues with literally preaching a sermon to those that are in the synagogue, to the Jews and the God-fearing Gentiles. And we see that Paul is speaking from his own experience. He speaks in the first person, and he speaks as one who shares their joy and knows their problems and their troubles. 
We see in Hebrews how Paul uses both exposition and exhortation in his sermon. So what is exposition? It is the description and explanation of an idea or a theory. Mm -hmm. Exhortation is the act or process of making a strong, urging appeal. Normally, it inspires people to action. Alternating between the two was a commonly used speaking technique during Paul's time, not only to drive home the point or points, but also to keep the listener's attention, to keep them captivated. We can see the exposition in chapter 1, God's final word and his son, the teachings of Jesus Christ, which is really God's teachings through the entire Bible leading to salvation. We don't have time to read the entire chapter, but we see the exhortation in chapter 2, verses 1 through 4, which reads, For this reason we must pay much closer attention to what we have heard, so that we do not drift away from it. And you see this, let's give an example, I love the, the imagery that he uses. If you're on the ocean, I love to fish on the ocean, if you're on the ocean and you have a small boat right next to the boat, and the two are not tied together, how long does it take them to separate? Not long. And unless there is some action keeping that boat near the other one, they will drift apart. In other words, that inactivity leads to separation from God. For if the, verse 2, for if the word spoken through angels proved unalterable, and every transgression and disobedience received a just penalty, we see there that God's law is unchangeable and the consequences of breaking it. Verse 3, how will we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? After it was at the first spoken through the Lord, it was confirmed to us by those who heard. And here we see how we will end up if we don't follow God's ways of salvation. There's only two paths in this world. One is wide and leads to destruction, and the other is narrow and difficult, but leads to God's salvation. And um, verse 4, God also testifying with them, both by signs and wonders, and by various miracles, and by gifts of the Holy Spirit according to his own will. I love this, because you know what God says is true by the signs and wonders, the miracles and the gift of the Holy Spirit that he gives. There are some things that only God can do. You've never seen the devil can do miracles, but can he raise someone from the dead? We see God in his power justifying and showing that what he says is true. This is powerful stuff, isn't it? So in this week's lesson, we see in Sunday's lesson a glorious beginning how this group of people we introduced, were introduced to Christ and the wonders they see, they see and the joy that they experienced. In Monday's lesson, we will see the struggles they experienced. Let me ask you, does the devil want you to come to God? To be saved? No. Not so much. No. He wants you right there with him at the end, being burned to eternal death separated from God for all eternity. I say this because we see the struggle we have in, they have in Hebrews. For today, if our lives are smooth and trouble-free, we're doing something wrong in our relationship with God. On Tuesday, we're going to talk about malaise. Simply put, being tired and worn out. Does the devil give up on derailing your relationship with God? No way. He will try until we fall asleep in Christ Jesus. He knows that one unrepented, cherished sin can keep us out of heaven. And after a while, he will wear us down, discourage us, or trip us up in any way he can with our walk in God if we do not stick with God daily and rely on him and him alone. This will happen over time. And today, in Wednesday's lesson, we'll talk about pressing together. Simply put, relying on other believers for, our support in our, for support in our Christian walk. Supporting one another, encouraging one another, praying for one another, remembering God's promises and claiming them. Most importantly, helping one another in action as well, not just words or well-wishing. And we'll see in Thursday's lesson, these last days. I'd like to bring that to us living today. You are either watching this now, 
and discovering the joy that Christ is bringing to you, your heart, or you already know that joy, and you're watching to learn more. As followers of the true biblical God, we will experience struggles in our lives. In some parts of the world, they are heavily persecuted for following Jesus. Here in the U.S., not so much. Although the devil still tries to cause us trouble whenever he can, but we are coming upon a time when we will have to choose between the mark of the beast and following God, and it will all revolve around worship. Then we will know persecution, just like the people in Hebrews did. Though these long-lasting or through these long-lasting struggles, we will know what Revelation 14:12 means. Here is the perseverance of the saints who keep the commandments of God and their faith in Jesus. Because in the end, that is all we will have left. The worldly things and honor will be gone. We will be despised by the world as Jesus was, as John 15, 18 through 21 clearly states, and God's people will press together to support one another in the end. Those that have refused the mark of the beast will be sealed by the living God, waiting for Jesus to return and take him home. Paul builds on the exposition and exhortation throughout Hebrews. He does that for them then, and he does it for us today. So Paul's sermon in Hebrews is for them and for us and the times to come. Barbara, can you tell us about Sunday, a glorious beginning? I know, and I believe every morning with God is a glorious beginning. It is. It is. Amen. But to understand um, Hebrews and the message and how it applies to ourselves, we need to understand a bit about the history of the congregation and their situation that they received uh, from the, uh, in the letter from the apostle. So let's start with Hebrews 2, 3, and 4. How shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed to us by those who heard him? God also bearing witness both with signs and wonders, with various miracles, gifts of the Holy Spirit, according to his will. So this, this passage implies that most of the Hebrew audience had not heard Christ in person, but rather through evangelists like Paul, Peter, who um, had taught them the word. And so um, as we look at these texts, uh, it, it shows concern that people are actually listening and following the word that they were given by God. But <clears throat> Paul also says that the evangelist had confirmed the message to them that God himself had borne witness in both signs and wonders. We saw that in, in Hebrew 2.3. This means that God had provided experiential confirmation of the gospel by signs and other powerful deeds, among them the distribution of the gifts of the Holy Spirit. So as we look back <clears throat> on the New Testament, we see throughout many miraculous signs, healings, exorcism, outpouring, uh, the use of spiritual gifts, often accompanied by preaching the gospel in new places. So at the beginning of the Christian church, God poured his spirit upon the apostles in Jerusalem. And we see that um, in the first uh, part of Acts, is how, if you remember the day of Pentecost, when the spirit was poured out on everyone. And we see them perform miracles. Like Acts 2 and 3, we see the Holy Spirit fall on, on the, the, gr the group, the 120 in the upper room. 3,000 were baptized in a day. That was, a, that was a first and a record. Hearing Peter, they were able to hear Peter's sermons in their own language, which was an amazing feat since there were people from all over who had come uh, to Jerusalem, all speaking many languages. But yet, when he preached, they, they were able to hear him in his own language. Many had traveled here um, just for the holy, the holy days. He heals the lame man at the uh, 
Gate Beautiful at the temple. Then we move on to Acts 8. We see Philip, who performed uh, similar wonders in Samaria. He was casting out demons and preaching Christ even in the beginning of the chapter. We see that Paul had been dragging Christians out of their homes and putting them into jail, and yet here is Philip boldly going out and preaching the gospel. And that, that is one of the things that really amazes me about the early Christians, their boldness, even though they were faced with death. And I think that's something that we need to be praying for, for ourselves. And we've got a week of prayer coming up, is that God will give us that boldness to share his words with others. Just that lack of fear that can only come from the Holy Spirit. Then in Acts 9, we see Peter in Joppa and Caesarea, healing Dorcas and Aeneas, who had been confined to a bed for years, realizing no man is unclean, and starts preaching to the Gentiles. And we see the Holy Spirit then falling on the Gentiles. And Paul's conversion, that's in a miracle in, of it, in and of itself. And after his conversion, he begins sharing Christ ministry through Asia Minor and Europe. Paul was probably one of the greatest evangelists <clears throat> of that in that time period, and it was all through the outpouring of the Spirit. And so, and in Acts 13 through 28, we see powerful deeds where experiential evidence that confirmed the message of salvation, the establishment of the kingdom of God, and a salvation for condemnation and freedom from the powers of evil. So let's move on now here to Hebrews 12, where uh, again, there's admonition to the followers of the Lord and not to lose sight of the calling. And if that happens, their freedom <clears throat> will be fulfilled and rewarded. So Hebrews 12, 25 through 29. See that you do not refuse him who speaks. For if they did not escape who refused him who spoke on earth, much more shall we not escape if we turn away from him who speaks from heaven, whose voice then shook the earth. Now he has promised, saying, Yet once more I will not shake the earth, but also heaven. Now this, yet once more, indicates the removal of things that are being shaken, as of the things that are made, and the things which cannot be shaken may remain. Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom which cannot be shaken, let us have grace by which we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. For the kingdom of God is a consuming fire. So, is our faith and our relationship with, so, with God so strong that it cannot be shaken. And that was the, really the message that Paul was giving to the, the, this Hebrew group, but it, he was also giving it to us, wasn't he? So the Spirit gave early Christian believers the conviction that their sin had been forgiven. Thus, they were not fearful of judgment, and as a result, their prayers were bold and confident, and their religious experience was joyful. In Acts 2, 37 through 47, we see, Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Men and brother, what shall we do? Then Peter said to them, Repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is to you and to your children and to all who are afar off, as many as the Lord your God will call. And this is vital for them as we see the church growing. And with many other words, he testified and exhorted them, saying, Be saved from this perverse generation. Then those who gladly received the word were baptized, and that day about 3,000 were added to them. And we talked about that just a little earlier. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship in the breaking of bread and in prayers. So we see that part of not only was accepting and following the Lord and understanding that they were free from, from sin, but they spent time with each other 
as well. And they um, broke bread together. They fellowshiped together. They prayed together. Then fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done through the apostles. Now all who believed were together and had all things in common and sold their possessions and good and divided them among as everyone had need. So they, they, kept, they held nothing back. They, they, were in, they were ready to move God's church forward. And if it meant giving up everything that they had, they did that as well. So continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, they ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily those things who were, who, would be, who were being saved. The Spirit also delivered those who had, were enslaved to evil powers, which was compelling evidence of the superiority of the power of God over the forces of evil, and revealed that the kingdom of God had been established in their lives. And so we, today, I pray for all of us, including myself, that we realize the kingdom of God is established in our lives. Amen. What a joyful beginning that was for them. Mm -hmm. So David, can you tell us about the struggle that came after this joyful beginning? Well, you know what the wise men say, what goes up must come down, and what come, goes down must come up. So it began with the glorious beginning, but then the cycle of struggle comes in. The book of Hebrews is, um, is a very good book, and I'm glad we are studying it. And if I had to give a title for this book, it would be God's autobiography to Hebrew Christians to give hope in Jesus through suffering and struggling. And it starts with the word God. It gives the authority that God is directing this book with Paul. See, um, the questions that come to mind about suffering for these people are, I have three questions that came to my mind. Who the suffering message is directed to? Why is this suffering message necessary for the people? And how can we make the suffering and struggle effective so that we can receive eternal life and it doesn't go in vain? So if we look at it, we see that the message is actually for everyone. Everyone, but especially the book of Hebrews was written to the second generation Hebrew Christians. And they were um, kind of uh, sad, and they were down because they were suffering. They were going places. They were in jail. They have been mislabeled as prideful, uh, uh, somebody, uh, somebody that do not follow the rules of, of life at that time. So uh, these people are going through a lot of suffering. You remember the book of Deuteronomy. When the Israelites were entering into the promised land, God also gave them the book of Deuteronomy so they can also be ready for the new beginning. And now, Revelation is, uh, and now this book of Hebrews is for the end times for us to understand what we need to do. So the second question is why is the message of suffering, um, why is it necessary? And the, and the answer is, uh, in Hebrew 12, 11, Paul says, now no chastening seems to be joyful for present, but painful. So we know that suffering leads to a state of pain. And the question uh, to that state of pain is uh, coming from the response struggle. See, people that are Christian and that are non-Christian, they all suffer and they all struggle. But the question is, are we struggling in vain? Are we struggling for Christ? See, the struggling is the response, response to how we respond to suffering. Uh, and, and the reason why we... Um, a struggle is because sometimes we struggle for the wrong reasons. And Paul um, is telling us that, hey, let's struggle for the right reason. Why do we need to struggle? Why do we need to respond to suffering differently than the world responds to suffering? You see, when the world struggles to respond to suffering, they want to stop the suffering. But God, Jesus, showed us that when we respond to suffering, we don't want to um, stop the suffering 
because we want to identify with Jesus. And that is the difference between a Christian suffering and a suffering of somebody that is suffering from the world. We suffer because we want to identify with Jesus, with God, and that makes a big difference. And that is why the message of suffering is important, because God is telling us that, you know, Jesus, he is the authority. He has the authority over everything. How did he get this authority? Isaiah 53, 5, it says, But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him, and by his stripes he was healed. Jesus was exalted by God to have authority over all things in his suffering, and his suffering and his struggle was to uphold the will of God, to die for us so that we can live. You see, if you read Micah 6, 8, God tells us how we should struggle, how we should respond to suffering. He says, he, he has shown you, O man, what is good and what does the Lord require of you, but to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with God. And if you dissect that, we see that doing justly, that means being kind, showing the fruits of the Spirit to somebody we love is not really justice. It doesn't take a lot of you know, effort to do that. But when we do the right thing for people who hate us, who give us pain and suffering, then that is true justice. That's what God wants us to do. That is the type of struggle he wants us to have. See, in this world, it is very difficult to do that, but we must struggle to um, love these people. And again, we want to talk about God said to love mercy. So what does love mercy mean? He doesn't say do mercy. He says love mercy. Jesus, from the cross, he forgave everybody. So God wants us to forgive and forget people that forget the, or deeds that people did to us so that we can love everybody. We can be uh, happy for their salvation. We can bring the gospel to them. And the last thing is he wants us to walk humbly with our God. Who walks humbly with God? People who do not form attachment to the possessions of this world. You see, when Job lost everything, all the earthly possession, what was his response? God gave, God take it, let all glory be to him. You see, Abraham was rich, Isaac was, was rich, but they had no attachment to their, sub, uh, to their worldly possessions. So we need to remember how, how can we struggle effectively. We cannot struggle, uh, struggle effectively if, if we have attachment to the worldly possessions. See, the, uh, this is how I remember this. This is the uh, saying that I say to myself, me is not, he is all I got. Me is not, he is all I got. Today, we have a different type of suffering. We have internet, we have social media, and when we are not in it, we feel lonely, we feel like we're suffering, but the real suffering comes when we are in those things and they direct take us away from God. So what that means is that it is a deceptive type of suffering. And we must be very careful how Satan created everything upside down, everything deceptive, that we actually fall into sin quickly. See, um, uh, P, um, Paul says, Hebrew 12, 7, that suffering is a way for us to be disciplined by God. And since we are the sons and daughters of God, uh, we should be disciplined. And by going through suffering, going through uh, suffering and we can struggle through it, we accept it, we delight in it, we actually become the true citizens of God. We share the glory of Jesus Christ with us. In Paul's word, Romans 5, 3 to 5, not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance. Endurance produces character and character produces hope. Um, Testimonies for the Church, volume 3, page 434 says that all the reproaches that fall upon the human believer fall upon Christ in the person of his saints. Uh, and he says, I will love him and will manifest myself to him. According to Psalm 34, the Lord is near to those with a broken heart and saves such as with a contrite spirit. When we suffer and struggle, for Jesus Christ, we are his beloved. That's the lesson. Amen. And I love mm -hmm. that where it points out even 
even when they lost all their goods, when they were publicly shamed and all these things, yeah. what did happen to Jesus? You know, how much contention and strife did Isaiah says he was a man of grief and sorrow. Exactly. So as we emulate <clears throat> that image that Christ had given us, we grow closer to understanding what really matters. Mm -hmm. I love that. Thank you. And to continue with this struggle, we're going to actually see just how Tuesday with malaise works into to struggling in this life. So Tuesday's lesson, malaise. What is malaise? The medical definition from Medical Plus, the medical encyclopedia says it's a general feeling of discomfort, illness, or lack of well-being. I remember when I worked in the clinical laboratory in the IT department, and it was a high-pressure department and, and all these things I wanted done yesterday. And I used to always joke when they had ICD-9 codes that, that when they asked how I was feeling, I was 780.79, which is malaise and fatigue. <laughs> and that was malaise and fatigue for the wrong reasons because that was something I chose to be in. And we can make those choices in our life, those bad decisions that bring unwanted consequences. But let's focus on the good malaise in our life. And we read the verse um, from Hebrews 2.18. For since he himself was tempted in that which he suffer has suffered, he is able to come to the aid of those that are tempted. So as we touched on before, does the devil want you to have a, a, a nice life? Or does he want you to have struggles and things like that, which God uses mm -hmm. to, to refine us and smooth out those edges? The malaise is just the continuation of the struggle. The ongoing persistence of the devil trying to lead us away from God, trying to get us to trip and fall. And we read from the lesson in Hebrews 3, 12 through 14. Take care, brethren, that there, there not be in any one of you an evil, unbelieving heart that falls away from the living God. But encourage one another day after day, as long as it is still called today, so that none of you will be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. For we must become partakers of Christ if we hold fast the beginning of our assurance firm until the end. So I love that in verse 14. It's saying that if you're with Jesus, you're going to be in it for the long haul. If you hold fast the beginning of our assurance firm until the end, then you are a partaker of Christ. Notice that condition. So if we look at Hebrews 4.15, for we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has been tempted in all things as we are, yet without sin. Can Jesus sympathize with us in every situation we've ever been in? Because he was tempted his entire life. If you look at the, even the 40 days in the, in the wilderness where we hear about the three temptations, that verb tempted there is a continual verb in the Greek, which means those entire 40 days he was tempted. He was tempted in his childhood. He was tempted throughout everything. He knows anything that we could possibly go through. And Luke 9, 22, 24, Jesus warned us of this. She says, saying the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and scribes and be killed and raised up on the third day. And he was saying to them all, if anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. That lived that life as Christ did. For whoever wishes to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake he is the one who will save it. I'll even say for the one who endures suffering for Christ's sake. We look at Luke 14, 26 through 27. If anyone comes to me and does not hate his own mother and father and wife and children and brothers and sisters, and yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. In other words, we have to put Christ first and we have to do it daily because we have to be in this for the long haul. And verse 27 says, whoever does not carry his own cross 
and come after me cannot be my disciple. Did Jesus give us an impossible task? No. He would never give us something that we could not overcome. He gave us the tools to overcome. He gave us the high priest in heaven who intercedes for us, the gift of the Holy Spirit, forgiveness for our sins when we repent. He's given us all of this. He does not ask the impossible of us. He did the impossible so that we might persevere and stick with him even when we fall. 1 Corinthians 10.13 says that no temptation has overtaken you, but such as is, is common to man. And God is faithful who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able, but with the temptation will provide a way of escape also so that you will be able to endure it. And Hebrews 13.15-8 through 8 talks about to make sure that the character is free from the love of money, being content with what you have. For he himself has said, I will never desert you, nor will I ever forsake you, so that we confidently say, the Lord is my helper. I will not be afraid. What will man do to me? Remember those who led you, who spoke the word of God to you, and considering the result of their conduct, imitate their faith. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. Here and now till he comes and for all eternity. Do people fall? Of course they do. We have an example of Elijah. Yes, he did. And in 1 Kings 19, 1 through 4. So what happened? He lost sight of God and he stumbled and fell. Jezebel threw him for a loop. He said he was no better than his father's and asked that he might die. There's a medical condition for what this is. It's called over um, Catastrophizing. Or, yes, thank you. <laughs> and there will be more on that in tomorrow's lesson. We never actually, and that's doom and gloom above and beyond. We're assuming the worst and believing in your heart it will happen. Do we ever do that? Do we ever assume the worst? Do we ever doubt God to follow through with this word? So what do you think happened to Elijah? Well, we know what happened to him. He repented and he's in heaven now. Because God met him just where he was at that time with compassion and love and some rebuke. But once again, we'll get into that tomorrow. So have you ever stumbled and fell? You may not have asked God to kill you, but did you ever feel unworthy or undeserving? Well, I got news for you. You are. We all are. But there's this thing called grace, and the grace of God makes us worthy and deserving. And what an awesome God that we have. So I want to read something from Ellen White. It's from Early Writings, and this is a vision she had. I saw some with strong faith and agonizing cries, pleading with God. Their countenances were pale and marked with deep anxiety, expressive of their internal struggle. Firmness and great earnestness was expressed in their countenances. Large drops of perspiration fell from their foreheads. Now and then, their faces would light up with the marks of God's approbation. And again, the same solemn, earnest, anxious look would settle upon them. Evil angels crowded around, pressing darkness upon them to shut out Jesus from their view, that their eyes might be drawn to the darkness surrounded them, and thus that they be led to distrust God and murmur against him. Their own safety was in keeping their eyes directed upward. Angels of God had charge over his people, and as the poisonous atmosphere of angel, angel, evil angels was pressed around these anxious ones, the heavenly angels were continually wafting their wings over them and scattering the thick darkness. As the praying ones continued their earnest cry, rays of light from Jesus came through to them and encouraged their hearts to light up their countenances. The angels of God left the some people 
who gave up, and to the aid of the earnest praying ones, I saw angels of God hasten to assist all those that were struggling with all their power to resist evil angels from trying to help themselves by calling upon God with perseverance. That sounds like Hebrews and the condition they are in. And Ellen White writes that this will be the condition of the end time people, the true followers of God. As followers of Christ, we are equipped with all the tools we need to persevere for the long haul to the end. It is, a time in, it is in that time of malaise that we will need to keep our eyes upon Jesus and him alone. Barbara, can you tell us about pressing together? Pressing mm. together. Mm. I don't think it's what you think. We're not no. going to get in a big old room all together. We and are not sardines. Yes, that's correct. But I was, I was thinking about this, this malaise, you know, this general feeling of discomfort that, that people get, and they're not really sure why, this malaise. And when we're feeling that, that is when we need to press. That is when we really need to press. And we see that happening with Elijah. And it's, it's so interesting. The, the, the story of Elijah just fascinates me because Elijah had just had a phenomenal win. I mean, you don't get any bigger wins than, than Elijah had on Mount Carmel True. when he fought that battle with God for who was, who, was, who was the true God. And then he, he destroyed the, all the prophets of Baal. and I mean, it was huge. And then one woman, we won't go into that, guys, no. but one woman says something, and he, he loses it and runs. Catastrophe. <laughs> Over-catastrophizing, absolutely. So we're going to look at this story in 1 Kings 5 through 8. 18, and we're going to look at, we're not going to look at every verse, but we're going to look at several verses here uh, about that. So here is Elijah, and he's had a long run about as far as here to the border of, <laughs> of the southern border in California. So as he lay and slept under the broom tree, suddenly an angel touched him and said, arise and eat. So this is the first thing God does for him. This guy had, he was exhausted, and God says, arise and eat. Then he looked by uh, his head, was a cake baked on coals and a jar of water. So he ate and drank and went back to sleep <laughs> and laid down again. And the angel came back a second time and touched him and said, okay, arise, eat, because the journey is too great for you. So he arose, ate, and drank, and went in the strength of the food 40 days and 40 nights as far as Horeb, the mountain of God. I don't know what was in that cake, but I'd like some. I know. That's a big cake. It's a satisfying cake is what it is. And there he went into a cave and spent the night in the place. And behold, the Lord came to him and said to him, Elijah, what are you doing here? So God was gently chastising him, wasn't it? Elijah, why are you yeah. here? This isn't where I want you. And, um, and so he said, I have been very zealous for the Lord, God of hosts. We're in verse 10. For the children of Israel have forsaken your covenant, torn down your altars, killed your prophets with the sword. I am left, and they seek my life. So he was having a real pity party here, um, he was. But the Lord didn't leave him that way. He said, go out and stand on the mountain before the Lord. And the Lord passed by, and a great strong wind tore into the mountains and broke the rocks in pieces before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake. But the Lord wasn't in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire but the Lord wasn't in the fire. And after the fire, a still small voice. And so we see that um, God, after he exhorted him a little bit, he showed himself to Elijah and said, okay, I'm here. I'm here in this small voice. I'm here comforting you. 
I'm here protecting you. And so um, after that, in verse 15, we see, Then the Lord said, Go return to the wilderness of Damascus, and when you arrive, anoint Hazel, king of Syria. So after he had fed him, let him rest, comforted him, told him that he was on the wrong path, and got him all normalized again, he sent him on a mission. He gave him a job to do. And so sometimes when we're struggling with God, he works with us the same way. And oftentimes if we have a job to do, it gets rid of that malaise that we have going on. Right. That's how we press together with God. So here in Hebrews, we see that Paul is telling them not to forget their first love. In Hebrews 2.1, Therefore, we must give the more earnest heed to the things we have, lest we drift away. He was concerned. They were concerned that they would drift away. And that's a concern we need to have today as well, that we don't drift away, because life gets so busy, it gets so overwhelming, there's so many issues in life that we just put God last rather than putting him first. Hebrews three twelve through 14 says, Beware, brethren, lest there be any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. But exhort one another daily. Well, it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through deceitfulness and sin. So share with one another. Have, have other godly people in your lives. For we have become partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence and steadfast to the end. We can do this for one another. One of the things I enjoy at this church is our small groups. And um, even today, I saw um, texts and encouragement going back and forth amongst the group. And so we are seeing that, and seeing that there are some who are going through trials. And we're there for one another. We lift each other up. And so that's what we can do with other godly people is be a support to them. Also, we have to work, look at spiritual immaturity. We see that in Hebrews 5, 11 through, 11 through uh, Hebrews 6, 3. Of whom we have much to say and hard to explain, since you have become dull of hearing. For though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you, again, the principles and the oracles of God. And you have come to need milk and not solid food. So there comes a point where we can't just continue to live on milk, but we need this solid food if we're going to press together with God. For everyone who partakes only of milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. But solid food brings those of full age, that is, those who by reason of use have their senses exercised both to discern good and evil. Therefore, leaving the discussion of elementary principles of Christ, let us go on to perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and faith toward God. So not only are we to get off the milk and onto the meat, but our works need to have purpose. Our works can't be fruitful and, and dead works, or we, won't, we are not showing our faith in God. Of one doctrine of baptism, of laying on of hands, of resurrection of the dead, and the eternal judgment. And this we will do if God permits. So we see, we, we, we need to dig deep. We need to understand all these principles. And then Hebrews uh, 19 through 25. Therefore, brethren, having boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus by a new and living way which consecrated for us through all through the veil that is his flesh having a high priest over the house of God let us draw near with a true heart full of faith and assurance okay there's pressing together isn't it let us draw near with a true heart full of assurance and faith having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water 
Let us hold fast to the confession of our hope without wavering. For he who promised, let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works. Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another so much more as we see the day approaching. So as we're getting closer to Christ's coming, we need to be spending more time together, studying, praying, and, and helping each other out. So through Hebrews, we can find several instructions that the, apostle, um, that the apostle gave the readers to help them recover their original strength and faith. One aspect that Paul emphasizes is the care of the physical needs and of the fellow believers. He suggests that they should practice hospitality and visit those in prison, which implied provided for their needs. So we'll see this in Hebrews 13, 1 through 6. But because we're running out of time, I'm going to let you read that for yourself. So when we press together, not only do we press together with one another in exhorting one another, in helping one another, taking care of others besides ourselves, we also press together with God. I love that because if you are a lone Christian, mm -hmm. you will be a dead Christian mm -hmm. because your faith will wither away without that encouragement of others. Yep. David, can you tell us about Thursday, these last days? You know, what do we say when somebody says, oh, today is my last day. What do you want to do? And say, live it up. You know, that's, that's generally the principle. Well, it's better to burn out than to the, fade away. Correct. That's exactly what it is. And, uh, you know, I feel really um, privileged to do this, the last section, uh, the Thursday section, these last days, because it includes all the other sections, Tuesday, Wednesday, Monday. You know, and uh, we know that the end times here in Hebrews um, chapter 1, verse 2, Paul is talking about the last days. It's urgent. There is no more time. You see, what happens is, we know that when we start running a marathon, and generally marathon runners, right before that certain mile, the last mile, is when they hit their body to the extreme and they cannot go any further. See, Satan is out there like a roaring lion. And he is there at, the, at these last days. We know he is going to deceive us in ways that I was talking about earlier that um, deceptive um, uh, struggle, things like that. That may seem like we're doing the right thing, we're in the right place, but we are totally deceived. So it's just like Barbara said, you know, just like Byron said, we really need to study. We need to be in the Word. We need to realize that it is, uh, it, uh, Satan is there to steal it from us. But we also have a responsibility to each other. You see, um, Israelites, right before they entered into the Promised Land, they went through a lot of um, temptation, suffering. See, just before they're ready to enter, they experienced trouble, they experienced rebellion, and people followed one another into destruction. There were, there were many immoral acts, but there were no true repentance. And God says, I do not delight in punishing evil. I want people to return to me, to repent. So Jesus, when he came, he actually told us how important it is to be ready for the end times. He gave us the parable of ten virgins, and we know that it is very important for us to be ready so that we do not miss Jesus Christ. We are critical ambassadors. If we call ourselves Christians, we are ambassadors for Christ, and as such, we must represent Christ to others, represent God to others. You know, God created us in His image and in His likeness. So it is inherently within us that we should be, we should struggle, we should work hard to represent God at all cost to others. So, in last days, God is telling us to avoid things. What should we do? Uh, what can we do to avoid, uh, you know, falling into traps? He is telling us, look to not be overconfident. Who is overconfident? Church of Laodicea. Lukewarm, everything is perfect nothing to do. I must be doing good because God is protecting me. Not true. He will vomit us. There is also a danger of compromising with the world. 
See, mm. Satan is the father of all lies and the greatest deceiver. So when we go through suffering, we must realize our struggle is not to stop the suffering. We don't, you know, we don't commit crime and suffer and consider that as a suffering unless we struggle through that crime and that punishment and want to get the forgiveness from Jesus, the mercy through the proper repentance. So we need to realize that when there's trouble comes, we do not drift away from God. Our struggle should be going towards God. So let us not compromise when troubles come. Also, well, another thing, we can d d take people out of salvation and even ourselves by our words and our actions. We can misrepresent God. See, um, this is very important how we speak to people. So there are some solutions that are in the Bible. Um, you know, Hebrews 6, 1, Barbara just read that we need to get deeper into the things. You know, think of it. We need to realize what's at stake. And for example, keep growing. Paul is saying keep growing, but how are we going to grow unless we repent? See, with repentance comes mercy, and with mercy comes growth. Uh, God says in, uh, to Paul, Romans eleven thirty two that he gave up everybody, everyone to disobedience so he can show mercy. So we are disobedient, but we need to repent because we need his mercy. Another thing that we can do is we need to speak life to everyone. Proverbs 15, 4, gentle tongue is a tree of life, but perverseness it, in it breaks the spirit. I want all of you guys to go and read uh, Proverbs 15 because it's the most beautiful um, chapter in the Bible that tells us how to speak to people. Um, another thing God hates, Proverbs 6, 16, proud look. See, as Christians, we need to realize that we should be approachable to people. Jesus was approachable by people in the society that nobody wanted to talk to. If we're not approachable Christians, then we cannot, um, in these last days, help each other to uh, get to the promised land. Again, the third thing is carry each other's burden to fulfill the law of Christ. Galatians 6, 2. See, the law of Christ is to bear each other's burden. I want to tell Barbara, Barbara, in Jesus, I have your back. I want to tell Byron, Byron, in Christ, can you please have my back? Indeed, we should have everyone's back. Thank you. And Barbara. the body. And the body. Because we are all, we're in one body. See, let's, let's make a habit of saying, I have a part in your salvation neighbor, and I will do whatever it takes to get you there. See, Spirit of Prophecy wrote this very nicely in that uh, book called That I May Know Him, page 228. Let me read this. You may have your choice as to who shall rule your heart and control your mind. If you choose to open the door to the suggestions of the evil one, your mind will be full, uh, filled with distrust and rebellious questioning. You may talk out of your feelings, but every doubt you utter is a seed that will germinate and bear fruit in an, another's life. And it will be impossible to counteract um, the influence of your words. You may be able to recover from your season of temptation, but others that have been swayed by your influence may not be able to escape from the unbelief you have suggested. How important is it, it is that we speak to those around us only those things which will give spiritual strength and enlightenment. You see, uh, Romans 12, 2, God, um, Paul says, do not be conformed to the world. Well, Jesus in the Old Testament, uh, Micah 6, 8, told us how to live a life, life of um, to do justly to your enemies, to people that do not love you, to love mercy, not to just do it, but love it, and to uh, be humble. See, those are new concepts because people are looking to be great. But here, God is telling us to be servants, right? That's a new concept. Again, Jesus actually elaborated that concept when he came on the Sermon of the Mount. And let me just go over that really quick. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Why they're poor in spirit? Because they feel unworthy of eternal life. They repent, they receive mercy, they grow. Now, blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. What are these people should mourn for? They should mourn for everybody's salvation. 
We should get each other's back. We should bear each other's burden. Blessed are the meek. Why? Uh, for they shall inherit the earth. Why? Because meek are approachable and they can bear each other's burden. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. Who is righteousness? Jesus' name is called the Lord is righteousness. We should thirst for Jesus. Blessed are the merciful. Why? Because to love mercy is what Jesus is looking for us, so that they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart. Because why? Because they have no deceit. They have no self-desire to elevate themselves through gossip, through worldly possessions, through their tongue. But they just want to only praise God and bring others to God, for they shall see God. And then, blessed are the peacemakers. Wow, Jesus, he is the Prince of Peace, right? And, that, and he uh, suffered in the face of, he did not fight back. What did he tell Peter? If you live by the sword, you die by the sword, for they shall be called the sons of God. You see, suffering, malaise, um, you know, all these things that we go through, um, it's part of the end times because Satan is revving up his effort to destroy us. And Christians should never be conforming to this world because we will eventually, see, Christ, remember, Christ was labeled as the one who blasphemed God, disobeyed the commandments of God, and committed violence against Rome. But Jesus was vindicated, not by God only, but even by Pilate, who said, I found no fault in him. These days, we know that we eventually will have the same problem. People will label us as lawbreakers, unfaithful, and treasonous, and sometimes maybe prideful. So let us stick with the promise so that God can tell us, I do not condemn you because I find no fault in you. Thank you. Amen. Yeah. Barbara, do you have some final thoughts? Yes, my final thought comes from the Desire of Ages. And I find that Ellen White speaks much more eloquently than I do, so I'm going to share her words with you. When the Spirit of God takes possession of the heart, it transforms the life. Sinful thoughts are put away, evil deeds are renounced, love, humility, and place take the place of anger, envy, and strife. Joy takes the place of sadness, and the countenance reflects the light of heaven. Isn't that what we've been reading in Scripture all night tonight? Now, no one sees the hand that lifts the burden or beholds the light descend from the courts above. The blessings come when faith, the soul surrenders itself to God. Then that power which no human eye can see creates a new being in the image of God. It is impossible for finite minds to comprehend the work of redemption. Its mystery exceeds human knowledge, yet he who passes from death to life realizes that it is a divine reality. The beginning of redemption we may know here through a personal experience. It results reach through the eternal ages. Amen. Thank you. And I'd actually like to read, I actually like the one in Friday's lesson. Um, Ellen White, Prophets and Kings, page 164 and 65. For the disheartened, there is a sure remedy, faith, prayer, and work. Faith and activity will impart assurance and satisfaction that will increase day by day. Are you tempted to give way to feelings of anxious foreboding or utter despondency? In the darkest days, when appearances seem most forbidding, fear not. Have faith in God. He knows your need. He has all power. That phrase, omnipotent, means all-powerful. His infinite love and compassion never weary. Fear not that he will fail of fulfilling his promise. He is eternal truth. Never will he change the covenant he has made with those who love him. And he will bestow upon his faithful servants the measure of efficiency that their need demands. The apostle Paul has testified. He said unto me, my grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, 
and reproaches and necessities and persecutions and distress for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then, I, then am I strong. 2 Corinthians 12, 9 and 10. God doesn't let us struggle for no reason. God doesn't allow us to be in these positions. We're there to glorify his name, to realize that he is the only one that truly matters in this world. That and the fact that we're supposed to be saving souls that are perishing. He wants us to love one another as he loves us. And that is our prayer and petition that each one of us realize that love he has for us, that realize what he's done for us. And whatever may happen in this world is nothing compared to what he has prepared for us for all eternity. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, you've done it all for us. You made the sacrifice. You have the plan of redemption Lord, you fulfilled that plan at Calvary. You gave us Christ as our example, Lord, to live in this world. You've given us and equipped us every tool we could possibly need to withstand the schemes of the devil, Lord, to empower us with, empower us with prayer and the sword of the Spirit against the enemy. Lord, we ask that you dwell in each and every heart for people watching as well and for Barbara and David that we may see you, that we might have a proper place for you to dwell in us, Lord, that you abide in us and that we may cling and hold fast to you. And the times of joy and the time of struggle, when it seems like we can take no more, Lord, that you are our strength that you are the light that shines within us and empowers us, Lord, so that we may persevere to the end. There will come a time when we may lose everything, but Lord, the one thing no man can take from us, nor the devil, is you and your love and what you offer us so freely. Teach us to embrace it daily. Teach us to appreciate, Lord, what we have truly been given. And teach us, Lord, to tell someone else that when we go to heaven, we may bring a friend or two or 50. Thank you for your mercy and your love that never ends. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Happy have a wonderful Sabbath. Sabbath. Happy Sabbath. Oh, and Happy New Year. And a Happy New Year.